Hello everyone, my name is Melanie Rektomopriti and I'm the director of the Center for Advanced International Theory here at the University of Sussex. I would like to welcome you to today's lecture by Dr. Onur Ulash Inge titled Locating Racial Capitalism Insights from a Trans-Imperial Frame. I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague um, Eve Wilcox for all her work getting us together this afternoon on this platform. A few words of housekeeping. This event will be recorded and published online, including on our center's YouTube channel. Dr. Inge will speak for around 30, 35 minutes, and then we have nearly an hour for questions and conversation. I'm now going to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Onur Ulash Inge is Associate Professor of Political Science at Singapore Management University and incoming senior lecturer in the Department of Politics at SOAS University of London, so soon will be neighbors. Um, Ulash's research um, sits at the intersection of political economy, political theory, and colonial studies. His award-winning first book titled Colonial Capitalism and the Dilemmas of Liberalism develops a materialist perspective on the liberal vindications of the British Empire in the early modern period. He's currently working on a second monograph that turns the same lens on liberal anti-imperialism in the same period. His articles on colonial capitalism, racial capitalism and imperial thought have appeared in American Political Science Review, the Journal of Politics and New Political Economy among others. His talk today broadly contours a new project that seeks to deprovincialize the study of racial capitalism by constructing it in a trans-imperial rather than a narrowly Atlantic frame. Ono, over to you. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that generous introduction, but also for this invitation. Um, as you have mentioned, this is a relatively new project and it's very much in progress. And therefore, I look forward to our discussion and hoping to, uh, to, to have the audience help me think through some of the, the, the questions and, and problems. Now, um, there are three parts of the talk. I will start with the origins of the project, where this came out of, um, its working arguments, and the historical framing of the project. I will then, the second, and then the second part and the bulk of the talk, illustrate some of the main arguments through a concrete study of a uh, concrete historical study of capitalist racialization in Asia. And I will say a few words by way of conclusion, tracing some of the broader implications of, of, of that particular historical study. Now, let me start with the, the, the provenance of this project. Well, this project grew out of um, a dissatisfaction with for the lack of a better term, the provincialism of the recent scholarship on racial capitalism. But by provincialism, I mean that the defining categories of racial capitalism as it pervades the extant literature um, have been by and large fashioned out of the historical experience of the Atlantic slave settler formation with indigenous dispossession and African slavery as the effective lines of racialization. So to illustrate, let me turn to two prominent figures that inspired much of the scholarship in the field. One is, one comes from Patrick Wolf. In an off-sided passage, Patrick Wolf argues, and I quote, as John Locke had provided, private property accrued from the admixture of labor and land. To put it very simply, blacks provided the former and Indians the latter. The application of enslaved black people's labor to evacuated Indian land produced the white man's property, a primitive accumulation, if ever there was one, unquote. Similarly, David Rodiger defines what he calls white managerial impulse as a self-proclaimed, quote, ability to manage other races as a distinctly white contribution to civilization which he then specifies as a set of claims, quote, to know how to manage Negroes better than Africans could manage themselves and to manage land better than the removed Indians who lived on that land, unquote. So in fact, this overwhelmingly Atlantic focus evidenced in these two quotations, or what I call methodological Atlanticism, has been conceded by the editors of the recent volume, edited volume entitled Histories of Racial Capitalism. 
the editors, um, uh, the Desson Jenkins and Justin Leroy, raised the question of how well the analytic of racial capitalism could travel to other contexts in the process, process admitting the heavily Atlantic focus of much of the scholarship in Spain. So a major objective of the project is to deprovincialize racial capitalism by situating the Atlantic and the Asia Pacific contexts in a larger trans-imperial frame and see what kind of theoretical insights and not only historical, but theoretical insights can be gleaned from a comparative and connected history of capitalism and race. Now, the working arguments of the project are twofold and let me just give away them at the outset rather than turning this into a detective novel where you have to wait until the, the very end of the, the, the script to, to see what the punchline is. The first argument is that racial capitalism is a generative research agenda and a powerful evocative heuristic, but the term itself is too loose and too vague to serve as a self-evident analytic category. And when invoked as a self-evident concept, which it usually is, it explains anything and everything, which is to say nothing in particular. Consequently, there is need for mid-level concepts and theories that can capture specific practices of racialization that have accompanied specific vectors of capitalist expansion, intensification, and reorganization. For instance, in the, in the first article that came out of this project, I propose capitalist racialization as a such, uh, such a mid-level concept, one that treats race not as the starting point, but the outcome of the capitalist elaboration of social difference interracial properties. The second argument, and this is a slightly more ambitious one, and one that I would like to pursue going forward, is to grasp, is, is that grasping the logic of capitalist racialization requires engaging the 18th and 19th century discourses of political economy and stadial theories of civilization and savagery, both of which receive little attention and analytic weight in the extant literature on racial capitalism. So to put it somewhat provocatively, I submit as a conjecture that the prehistory of racial capitalism can be excavated at the intersection of political economy and civilization and savagery. And importantly, these are both distinctly modern discourses that have little to do with the pre-Columbian racialization in feudal Europe, an origin story recently popularized by Cedric Robinson and his followers. Now, of course, I cannot fully elaborate these two points in the span of a single talk, but I can hopefully contour the project enough to raise some questions and engagement. So let me turn to the historical framing of this problematic. For me, the history of the British Empire offers a productive point of entry to this query for several reasons. The first and the four most obvious one is the fact that the British Empire was an inter-oceanic entity that straddled the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the South Pacific. And of course, this is not just a geographic argument. The theoretical corollary of this geographic expanse is to highlight the constitutive heterogeneity of Britain's imperial economy. So what is at stake here is a variegated totality of colonial capitalism that comprised the slave colonies of the Caribbean, the East India Company's fiscal militarism in South Asia, private merchant capitalism in Southeast Asia, and settler capitalism in the white dominions of North, North America and South Pacific. Now I'd like to pause and dwell for a minute on this term variegated totality as sketch its theoretical leverage for the study of capitalism and race. Variegation in this expression variegated totality indicates the co-presence of different and frequently competing agendas of commanding land, labor and markets presenting different possibilities and imperatives to elaborate social difference into racial hierarchies. Totality emphasizes the fact that by the late 18th century, the British Empire had become a competitive project in what Jeremy Edelman called a mise en valeur, that is maximization of the commercial value of nature through an imperial division of labor, whereby empire's peripheries were to be governed and their economies developed in the service of an industrializing metropole. Now, there is an implicit, at least in this talk, an implicit Marxian theory of colonial capitalism behind this framing of imperial history, which I cannot unpack here, but would be happy to talk more about. 
um, in the discussion if there's an interest. But briefly put, this framework of the imperial political economy pushes our gaze beyond the Atlantic and opens up to comparative and connected histories of capitalism and race. The totality of colonial capitalism enables tracing connections, while its inner variegation allows for comparison across these connected specific moments and sites of capitalist racialization. Now, of course, this might sound a little too abstract and skeletal, so let me substantiate it and put some flesh on the bones, so to speak, through a concrete historical study that informs my recent and ongoing research. That is the liberal campaign to reform the British Empire and especially its political economy in Asia in the first half of the 19th century. Now the project focuses on this particular campaign in this particular period because it lays bare the fraught entwinement of the histories of capitalism, liberalism and race. The second quarter of the 19th century, say roughly from the 1820s through the 1840s, was a period of intense agitation for imperial reform. Of course, the most notable landmarks of this agitation were the liberalization of the Asia trade in the 1830s, the abolition of slavery in the same decade, and the abolition of the corn laws and the navigation laws in the 1840s. So over the course of this period, we witness, or at least the observers thought they were witnessing, Britain's old colonial system, the mercantile system, morphing into an industrial and commercial empire of free trade and free labor. And of course, this was not driven simply by a magnanimity of the heart and an investment in liberal ideas, but in part driven by fears of economic distress and social unrest in Britain. The dominant view on the political economy of Britain at the time was that it was suffering from an excess or glut of capital and labor, lacking profitable fields of investment and employment. And many contemporaries turned to the empire's peripheries for the solution to England's economic, political, and social ills. On the one hand, for instance, there was the colonial reform movement led by Edward Gibbon Wakefield um, that pushed for the systematic settler colonialism in Australia and New Zealand as a way of exporting surplus capital and labor to white dominions. I've dealt with this topic elsewhere, and I'm not going to get into this um, during this talk, but again, if there's an interest, I'd be more than happy to, to, to dive into it during the discussion. On the other hand, at the center of this particular project was at the India reform movement that pushed for the capitalist colonization of India and Southeast Asia, by remaking the region into an export-oriented plantation economy. And this was a movement that brought together a wide-ranging, truly trans-imperial constituency, ranging from the Glasgow uh, East India Association and Man Manchester manufacturers, ma manufacturers to philanthropists in, um, in, in London, to Bengal Landholders Association, to Calcutta Merchants and the Singapore Chamber of Commerce. So this was a truly trans-imperial movement. And it found one of its most sophisticated and theoretically coherent spokespeople in John Crawford, which is at the center of this, this recent um, article that came out of this project. Now the political economic thrust of India reform targeted unlocking the commercial potential of India as a source of tropical products and a vast market for British manufacturers. So the idea was to transform India into a producer of cotton, sugar, and coffee, amongst other tropical products, for British and European markets, thereby undercutting the slave-produced econ economies in the same products that we're talking about, the economies of the Atlantic, US, Brazil, and Spanish empire. At the same time, lifting Indian cultivators out of poverty. So the newspaper British Indian Advocate, the organ of the British India Society, ran with the banner, quote, justice to India, prosperity to England, freedom to the slave. Now importantly, at least for this project and the intellectual history aspect of this, the priorities of imperial reform in India were defined in the language of classical political economy and not so much in, say, uh, missionary evangelism. Its objectives, put simply and schematically, were the increased commercialization of Indian economy and increased division of labor, both between town and country and in the actual production process, 
achieving economies of scale, establishing labor discipline, increasing productivity, and the application of science to agricultural production and light and agronomy. And all of this was to be driven, at least in the minds of the proponents of this project, not by the hand of the state or the, you know, let alone the company, which was considered to be a despot and the principal obstacle to the uplift of India. All this was, was to be driven by the investment of excess private British capital at the time glutting the British economy. Against this backdrop, the export-oriented capitalist plantation was held out to be the telos and the yardstick for measuring socioeconomic development in the region. And by modern colonial plantation, I'm referring to the a, a capitalist formation par excellence that originated in Brazil in the 16th century and was perfected in Barbados as a unit of agrarian capitalism in the course of the 17th. And the key to this formation theoretically speaking, was the subordination of land and labor to the command of capital, or what Marx and following Marx historians um, called the real subsumption of labor. And when judged by this metric, the smallholding peasant cultivation prevalent in South and Southeast Asia was found by metropolitan observers to be woefully deficient. And it was a, de it was a, and it was a deficit that was expressed in the language of civilization and savagery originally formulated by the Scottish Enlightenment luminaries like Adam Smith, um, Adam Ferguson, William Robinson, and uh, Dougal Stewart, who taught at the University of Edinburgh when, for instance, um, John Crawford and William Jordan were medical students um, taking also courses in, in natural history. So the Scottish Enlightenment state of theory, this theory of civilization and savagery, furnished a classificatory grid that drew much of its semantic content from categories of classical political economy, which proved critical as an ordering system for organizing social difference into racial hierarchies in the 19th century. So Smith's writings, of course, exemplify this imbrication of political economy and civilizational discourse, which would become rather potent in the hands of those with a less skeptical and cosmopolitan sensibility than Smith. So many colonial administrators who served in Asia, like Crawford, had imbibed from the fountain of classical political economy. And one should recall that Britain's first academic chair in political economy was established at Haleybury College, itself founded to train the East India Company Corps to be stationed in India. Thus, it is no surprise that these administrators' view of the various communities in South and Southeast Asia was inflected by the civilizational freight of political economy. An exemplary in this regard is the figure of John Crawford, who was a colonial administrator, political economist, a political radical, and a liberal advocate of imperial reform, who served under the company in India and Southeast Asia for 20 years, and was considered to be an authority on the commercial potential of the region. So in addition to writing reams of pamphlets, he also appeared before the parliamentary committees and actually served on select committees on matters of India, Southeast Asia, and East India, and so East, uh, East Asia trade, China trade. Crawford's writings are significant for demonstrating the status of political economy and the stadial theory of civilization as ideational precursors to capitalist racialization, or so is my conjecture. One finds here not a theory of racial capitalism, but a capital theory of race. That is one of the major theoretical uh, interventions that I'm trying to advance in this project. A capital theory of race that derived racialized categories from the universal precepts of political economy as mediated by the discourse of civilization and savagery. And I would like to reiterate at this point that Crawford's theory or writings were not unique or anomalous, but rather exemplary and exemplary in their consistent and coherent formulation, sophistication of a broader discursive formation. Now the basis of racial hierarchies in Crawford's political economy tracked the perceived degree of subordination of land, labor, and social reproduction to the command of capital. And this is evident in Crawford's absolute contempt for Indian agricultural production, which he decried as backward, primitive, barbarous, 
and capable of producing nothing fit for export. So in this regard, he was actually much closer to James Mill, ironically because James Mill had never left Britain when he wrote The History of India, whereas Crawford had spent about 20 years in the region. And his writings, that is Crawford's writings, were littered with frustration about the unrealized potential of Indian cotton, tea, sugar, coffee, and vanilla, and so on. Now, the key point here that I'd like to emphasize is that Crawford's verdict on Indian barbarism and backwardness, ignorance and idleness, which would later furnish the semantic content of racialized tropes about Indians, was a function of political economic analysis rather than an expression of an a priori cultural prejudice. It was an outcome of political economic analysis employing universal categories of division of labor, rent, profit, wages, accumulation of capital, and so on. Now, the solution proposed by Crawford, and again, I'm saying Crawford, but the solution united behind itself colonial administrators like Thomas Metcalf and William Bentinck, Indian liberals like Ramohan Roy, um, continental political economists like Sismundi or Jean Baptiste, and so on and so forth. And this solution was the administrative, administrative reform in India to encourage the settlement of white British subjects with capital and connections, who would then, as prospective investors and plantation owners, be the locomotive of India's transformation. So, in other words, India had to be almost literally colonized by capital. And in this case, the model to emulate for Indian reform was furnished by the colony of Singapore, from which I am connecting currently. It was unsurprising because Crawford himself was the governor of Singapore from uh, 1823 to 26 during his fledgling years and took pride in his contribution to setting up a colony of free labor, free trade, and free settlement governed by the enlightened institutions and laws of Britain. So in that regard, Singapore had an outsized influence imagine on the imaginary, the political imaginary of reformers as an ideational crystal of a liberal empire of commerce and capital. And Singapore, and more broadly, the British Strait Settlement of which it was a part, also incorporating Penang and Malacca, is significant for an analysis of the workings of capitalist, uh, capitalist racialization on at least two registers. First, the Strait Settlement, and Singapore in particular, was a major target of Chinese immigration, as well as a hub for onward Chinese migration to Southeast Asia. British colonial administrators, merchants, and missionaries were struck by the commercial acumen and enterprise, the business sense of the Chinese diaspora. Crawford was particularly impressed by the Chinese-owned and managed plantations of sugar, tobacco, and pepper in the region, as well as tin mines. The combination of Chinese capital and local labor in plantation agriculture in the region held out a local template for British capitalist colonization in Asia, or what I call in the paper, a British settler colonialism in, uh, with, uh, with Asia, Asian characteristics. In this vein, Crawford referred to the diasporic Chinese, and I quote, as Chinese colonists. And his choice of expression, Chinese colonists, was not a slip of the tongue, nor was it a mere metaphor, because it followed a distinctly colonial capitalist logic. In an article he published in the Westminster Review entitled Sugar Without Slavery, he wrote, and I quote, the industry is theirs, that is the Chinese colonists. The industry is theirs, the skill is theirs, the machinery is of their construction. The natives of these countries, speaking of Southeast Asia or the, the, what he called the Indian archipelago, the natives of these countries furnish nothing but cheap labor. The Chinese supply the place of the European colonists in America, the natives the place of the Negroes of the West without stripes or bondage, unquote. So according to this analogy, Crawford and his contemporaries held the Chinese as a character and as a type in considerably higher civilizational standing compared to, quote, the Hindu or the Malay laying down the civilizational gradations that would, in the course of the 19th century, ossify into racial types. And I'll try to say a few more words on how this perception, likely when it was transvalued, fed into the fears of the yellow peril half a century later. 
Now, the point to emphasize here is that the effective chains of racial equivalence and the lines of racial division were derived from the capitalist subsumption of land and labor and not from a priori racial prejudices or cultural prejudices. Thus, Southeast Asia, and this is a point that has been made in, in, in uh, in originary form by Sayyid Hussein Alatash, and, and Alatash in his, in his uh, book, Myth of the Lazy Native, again, is not a reference point in, in, in the literature on racial capitalism, in my humble opinion, to the detriment of, of the scholarship. So Southeast Asia, in that regard, presented a key site of the articulation of capitalist hierarchies of race amongst the Asian subjects of empire showing that the effective lines of racialization were not simple and binary, the running across the European, non-European, white or non-white um, lines, but gradated, and gradated in line with the priorities of British colonial capitalism in the region. And the same hierarchy also manifested itself in a racial calculus of labor productivity, or more accurately, I should say, a labor calculus of race, once again, inverting the terms of analysis. In ranking the Chinese above the Indians and placing both beneath the English, Crawford relied on the market wages of labor as the indicator of civilizational attainment. Deduced from the differential wage rates paid to the same type of work in the same market, the average productivity of labor furnished an allegedly objective standard for ranking different races. For instance, Crawford averaged and I quote, the relative productiveness of the Indian industry across artisans, mechanics, and cultivators, and conjectured that, and I quote, four, that is four Indian artisans, mechanics, or cultivators are equal to one Englishman. So the ratio of four to one based on labor productivity as indexed on the wages that are derived um, for the same work on the same market. But Crawford also extended the capitalist law of value to comparing the non-European populations to each other. He estimated, and I quote here, quote, the average value of the labor, skill, and intelligence of a Chinese to be in the proportion of three to one to those of native of the continent of India, unquote, which again was indexed on the higher wages paid to the Chinese laborer. So by adopting capital's law of value as the universal metric of civilization for ordering racial difference, Crawford fashioned his principles of hierarchical differentiation out of universal premises rather than as exceptions to them. So the universal premises furnished the very principles of particularization that was settled into racial hierarchies. And in doing so, he merely gave theoretical expression to a broader 19th century discursive formation that racialized social difference by the metric of value in line with the priorities of British colonial capitalism in the region. Let me give you a very brief um, collage of, of, these, of these statements. For instance, General Alexander Walker, the governor of St. Helena, averred in 1826, and I quote, the labor of one European worker is equal to that of at least two Chinese. David Gorbin Forbes, a British settler in Australia who tried to recruit Chinese and Indian coolie labor for Australian plantations, observed in 1846, quote, I had six Bengal coolies in my employ in the bush and have no hesitation in saying that three Chinamen would have done their work, unquote. James White, the labor recruitment agent for British Guyana, noted in 1851, and I quote, in physical ability for labor and the endurance of toil, I should consider one Chinese equal to two of the inhabitants of Bengal, unquote. So again, the thread that runs through this pronouncement is the priorities of British colonial capitalism. And these priorities manifest themselves in generating and elaborating social difference in increasingly racialized terms. And on that note, let me wrap this up by revisiting the implications of viewing racial capitalism through imperial lenses. Now, as I hope it is somewhat clearer, colonial capitalism in Asia was no less racialized in its institutional and ideological configuration than the Atlantic colonial capitalism. Yet the configuration of capitalist expansion and the racialization of social difference here cannot be decoded 
with the Atlantic hermeneutic of slavery and indigenous elimination. And in fact, India reformers explicitly contrasted their vision for India with atrocities of the American settler slave societies. For instance, in addressing the British India Society, the famous abolitionist and lecturer George Thompson lamented the, quote, bitter fruits of European colonization for the Red Indian before declaring, and I quote, I would have, I would have our wharves covered with sugar and cotton and tea and rice and indigo of India, but I would not have a single native of the country enslaved or dispossessed. So this is to suggest that deprovincializing racial capitalism necessitates conceptual innovation to account for diverse episodes of capitalist racialization beyond the Atlantic. When we turn to Asia, simply invoking racial capitalism yet again does not do much to illuminate the specific terms of racialization accompanying specific vectors of capitalist expansion in this period. And secondly, as I hope it is also somewhat clearer, an analysis of racial capitalism has to engage with entwined discourses of political economy and state of theory, as at once classificatory schemes, epistemic paradigms, and language of languages of imperial governance. For it is the intersection, at the intersection of these two discourses that we find the prehistory of racial capitalism. And again, as my own starting point or entry point to this uh, query, the transitional or interstitial status of race in John Crawford's work is very illuminating because it is there one finds the bleeding together of environmental, institutional, and biological racial explanations of social difference. Because Crawford himself started out as a natural historian, he was a rare polygenist of his time, but he started as a natural historian with universal Scottish Enlightenment premises and ended up with borderline scientific racist. He was one of the founders of the uh, Anthropological Society of London, which broke away from the London Ethnological Society, the Ethnographic Society, I'm sorry, uh, on account of the, uh, the disagreement over the, the polygenism and monogenism and the, uh, the, the controversy raised by Darwin's work. So in that sense, Crawford is exemplary or it encapsulates the broader shift in European attitudes that started out in the 19th century uh, with institutional environmental explanations of social difference, kind of in the heritage of the late 18th century Scottish Enlightenment, and ended up with uh, pre-Darwinian um, the, the, the mode of ethnography and race science, um, bleeding later on into the Darwinian full-blown scientific racism. So let me say just a few words relatively spontaneous on the links. And this is, this is a pure conjecture, so we'll have to see um, if this pans out. But in the course of my, of my studies, of my research into this, I have come across some scattered remarks by um, British observers mainly, um, ranging roughly from the 1840s to 1880s, um, about the prowess, the increasing prowess of the Chinese as a race in Southeast Asia and premonitions that the Chinese might displace or replace the indigenous races, the indigenous peoples in Southeast Asia. Now, this is a very curious statement. And again, the triangulating this uh, will take some time because the capacity to displace and replace um, other races was conventionally reserved for the Anglo-Saxon races or the white race. So then the question becomes, what is the common denominator, the basis on which the Chinese diaspora in particular can be attributed the same kind of capabilities or capacity or, or drive that was previously reserved only for the white races or the Anglo-Saxon races um, in this discourse of the vanishing of the disappearing races. And my wager is that it is the capitalist racialization, the capitalist construction of the Chinese character in the 1820s and 1830s that I started tracing in this project, which once a, an asset for the British imperial administrators who were looking for a mobile, pliable, and industrious, as they put it, uh, labor force for plantation work, uh, gets transvalued in the 1880s and 1890s into um, a, a threat 
basically, um, that is capable of overrunning and inundating um, the, uh, the, the, the white um, uh, settler colonies uh, to begin with. So that's basically the, the vanishing point, if you will, the horizon of, of the current project. So that I would like that I intend to be on this, the, this paper and the chapter in, in the, 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 the second book. Um, I have a couple of papers um, in mind. One explores what I just outlined and the other one uh, pushes further into excavating the prehistory of race and the discourse of the language of political economy and civilization savagery. So let me let me stop there and thank everyone for their attention and for the time. I very much look forward to our uh, exchange. Thanks so much, Ulash. Um, we now have a good 40 minutes for questions and answers. If you like to speak, please put an X in the chat box and I will call on you. Alternatively, um, you can leave your question or comment in writing in the chat box and I will read it out on your behalf. And would you please introduce yourselves? Julian German. Hi, thank you so much for this really um, fascinating talk. Um, I, I, I really appreciate your focus on specificity. And I was wondering whether you could push the inquiry a little bit further because you know, you're comparing sort of two forms of uh, racialized capitalism in two different regions, right? But I wonder whether even looking at just one region, you find sort of you know, very discursive formations that use um, you know, racialized hierarchies in combination with, uh, with, with, you know, some sort of sense of capitalist industrialization in, in many different ways. Is this really the predominant one that you find when you look at this particular region? Or are there competing narratives? Thank you very much. Well, that's a fair question. That's a fair question. Um, no, there are obviously uh, the competing, or competing at least, at least a variegated terrain, uh, this internal variegation of the discourse of racial capitalism. And this 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 pertains to uh, the discourses in um, the the um, in the North American context, in the Atlantic context, and it's it's quite ribbon. It's a, in the nineteenth century there is a convergence, there's a settlement of 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 such discourses, or at least they say kind of a simplification through, I guess, one could argue through somewhat of a um, uh, the, the, the competitive ecology that there has to be convergence, and in the at the end of the day, what this convergence manifests itself in is various legislations and court cases, and this is the kind of uh, work. Uh, this is the kind of process that's traced by, for instance, Robert Nichols's uh, recent brilliant book, uh, Theft Property: The Recurrence of Logic of Dispossession in the North American Context." And likewise, uh, one, if one turns to um, the South and Southeast Asian context or the Asian context generally, if one have the, the rim brain extending from the South to, to East Asia, uh, of course, that there, that there is there's controversy. There is disagreement over the parameters or the coordinates, I should say, of racialization. And so that, that the certain thinkers and observers, administrators, merchants have a less generous view of the Chinese, for instance, Chinese settlers than, than, than others. Um, certain uh, that observers are a lot more um, optimistic about the, uh, the, the, the capacity of, of improving and, and, and civilizing and, and developing um, the Indian economy and the, the Indian labor force and so on. So th there, there's a lot of jostling um, and some of these gets translated in piecemeal into policy um, others don't, right? And some of, and then of course, the practical experiments and failures um, play a huge role in shaping and reshaping the coordinate, the contours of racialization, right? Um, in particular, for instance, when we think thinks about the failed experiments of of of, of, of Chinese immigration to, to Assam for tea cultivation or to Ceylon um, for 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 coffee cultivation, and the failure of these. Uh, projects lead to um, overlaying the, the previous attributes with unruliness, 
of extreme venality, of, of extreme pecuniary and disorderly um, conduct, and so on and so forth. So it's 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 not only multifarious, but it's also fluid. It shifts over time. And as I said, one of the uh, the 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 threads that I'd like to follow and see if it leads anywhere is this is to see if there's an underlying continuity between the Chinese character as this character uh, constructed in the 1820s and 30s and Stan Neal's work is, is brilliant um, in this regard um, and the much more uh, frequently much more the, the, the widely studied uh, discourse of, of, um, of the yellow peril um, in the late 19th century but thank you for that question um, so yeah, there is there is variation and it's of a concept of, of interest to intellectual historians there's no doubt about that um, but it's it's when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, when these representations, these constructions, um, find their way into policy and, and, and an imperial practice that one sees that sort of the concretization, if you were, of the, these categories in action, which themselves act back on those categories. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat box. Um, would you like me to read it out? Um, so the question is from Van An Viet Nguyen. It says, in your recent paper, Deprovincializing Racial Capitalism, John Crawford and Settler Colonialism in India, in your conclusion, you say, quote, if, as has been argued, capitalist expansion proceeds as much by the assimilation of existing social relations as their subordinate articulation, and if historical capitalism is thereby characterized by heterogeneity as a matter of necessity, then it becomes easier to conceive of racialization as one of the principles of differentiation internal to capitalist development. Pursuing this threat can bring us closer to the theoretical core of the premise, capitalism has always been racial capitalism. And so the request here, would you kindly explain and expand on this conclusion? Thanks. Uh, thank you for that question. I mean, this is a big kind of worms, and obviously I cannot um, answer this conclusively here. But um, so let me start with uh, what I think about this premise that capitalism has always been racial capitalism. Capitalism has al always been gender cap or patriarchal capitalism as well. Yeah. And one of the question that's begged by that statement is what are we talking about when we talk about racial capital like capitalism has always been racial right why do we then call it racial capitalism rather than just capitalism so what is the theoretical value added by adding that moniker and one of the the hazards, let's say, of adding these qualifiers is that they tend to substitute for theoretical analysis. So it becomes a habit of concatenating a bunch of um, declamatory uh, qualifiers and a white supremacist, racial, heteronormative, patriarchal, sexist capitalism, and the job, the work of critique is done. Right? So the, that, that statement, that uh, concluding statement is an invitation to think thoroughly about what aspects of race are in what ways race is constitutive of capitalism or at what level of differentiation, what kind of specific level or aspect of differentiation within capitalism's historical unfolding um, it occupies. And there's a long-standing theory, uh, that, uh, that, that, that theoretical tradition, effort, let's say, conversation about um, theorizing the internal variegation and historical development of capitalism. Right? And one of the more uh, prominent, if uh, um, thorny, uh, that, that, um, uh, expressions of this uneven and combined development, so the, the Trotskyite line, right? that capitalism um, develops historically, even though it, is had, it has a discernible logic, it historically unfolds through differentiation and striation rather than universalization. Yeah. And then the question becomes, where does race fit in that history of internal differentiation and variegation as the mode of capitalism's historical development? That's the question that, uh, that, uh, that statement is, is posing. Yeah. 
And therefore, the most I can do at this point, and one could say the same thing about gender and other forms of um, hierarchical um, differentiation, like where they fit in a, um, a theory of capitalism. And because one of the, the, uh, the, the trends that I, that I tend to observe is that most of, I'm, I'm not saying all, but a, a good chunk of literature on racial capitalism does not really develop a theory of capitalism. And this is kind of acknowledged by some of the, uh, the, 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 the overviews of say the new history of capitalism. Uh, the, the, um, Seth Rockman, for instance, admits that says just mostly we talk about commerce, money, profit, it's kind of capitalism, but doesn't really have a theory of what is meant by capitalism. Yeah. And one need not have, one need not subscribe to a particular theory. I mean, I work with Marxian concepts, but one could think about the Darian and Polanyian or even the Lenin concepts when, when one theorizes it. But this is a call, in other words, to be uh, conscious and then premeditated and, and, and explicit about uh, the terms and the theoretical framework edifice uh, within which those terms fit. So that it's not just a throwaway remark that it applies anything and everything that racial capitalism has always been racial capitalism it rolls off the tongue quite nicely but what does it mean and so that statement is basically a, um, a call an invitation to think more deeply and self-consciously about that question and what if then the final remark i mean if the, the one of the, the the theoretical inspirations that i've found is for instance harry hartunia's work and then you know, the, the book, uh, Marx After Marx, when he works with the, the categories of real and formal subsumption for theorizing actually existing capitalism's historical unfolding, or the recent works on that, that, that label themselves historical capitalism or historical capitalisms to differentiate um, that particular methodological approach from the earlier debates between, you know, the transition debates between the, uh, the, the new Smithian Marxists and political Marxists and so on. So I hope this answers the question somewhat sort of roundabout way. Great, I think we have a bit of a follow-up question um, by my colleague, Luisa Odysseus, um, who posted her question in the chat box of going to read it out. Um, it says, thank you very much for your talk and apologies for missing the first part of your talk. I had to collect a sick child from school. Could I please ask how you relate your explorations of racial capitalism to Cedric Robinson's who located the co-emergence and co-articulation of capitalism and racialism out of feudalism. Here is Robin Kelly's useful synopsis, and she's quoting, capitalism was racial not because of some conspiracy to divide workers or justify slavery and dispossession, but because racialism had already permeated Western feudal society. The first European proletarians were racial subjects, including the Irish, Jews, Roma, or gypsy, gypsies, Slavs, and so forth. And they were victims of this possession, including through enclosure, colonialism, and slavery within Europe. Indeed, Robinson suggested that racialization within Europe was very much a colonial process involving invasion, settlement, expropriation, and racial hierarchy, end quote. Okay. Thank you for that question, um, because I do indeed um, take issue with that, or at least I'm not convinced by it. Um, I, I, I remain, I, I start to be convinced. It's just, a, uh, I find it uh, difficult to parse out what differentiates race and racial capitalism or capitalist racialization from the much longer standing and much uh, more global, if you will, it's kind of trans-historical and trans-contextual um, organization of expropriation and exploitation based on perceived inferiorities or superiority and inferiority of one people over another. And you have this in the, the tributary systems um, of the Middle Kingdom around so sort of the, 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 the polities around it. You have it in the, the, um, the, the, the engagement of the, the Valley Kingdoms in Southeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis the Hill Tribes. Um, so if perceived difference 
and differentiation and assumptions of superiority used to organize and justify expropriation, exploitation. And if that is racialization, then racialization becomes a transhistorical and transcontextual, trans I guess, um, phenomenon. So it really does not explain uh, much what is specific to race and racialization as a principle of differentiation and hierarchization. And this is my uh, the interpretation of Cedric Robbins's Black Marxism, which everybody claims, everybody cites, but uh, when inquired, they usually read the first two chapters and then move on. Um, Robbins's work or the, the, the or project is to construct a different uh, canon, not Marxist canon, the Black Marxist canon. And his construction of racial capitalism is retrofitted to, 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 um, to build that canon. So uh, the, the readings and the, the, the analysis of the Black Marxists, the Black Marxist tradition, I find persuasive, but for the theoretical framing that will make that canon formation, alternative canon formation possible, I think he uh, gets into, um, or he reads back into Europe um, phenomenon that are post-Columbian. Right? And in this regard, I think Stuart, uh, the Robert Bartlett's work is more convincing, but, and then there might be um, surface analogies or imagistic analogies between the post-Columbian colonial expansion and the pre-Columbian feudal ex at the expansion. But I mean, Christendom's expanding and, and subordinating and, and, and enslaving um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Eastern European polities Calling that racial, um, racializing, um, and enclosures, ex ex dispossession, um, is is to read a story of primitive accumulation of capital um, back to a period and a context where there is no primitive accumulation because primitive accumulation, and the terms therein, assume their theoretical significance as the prehistory of capital and the feudal Europe and the feudal um, like pre-Columbian feudal expansion and whatever you want to call it, inner, internal colonization, if you can call that, um, does not belong to that history. So I think I'm much more closer to, like I, I find at least personally much more persuasive the account provided, for instance, by Robert Black, Robin Blackburn's account of slavery and racialization um, in the Atlantic um, that accompanied it. So, In, in, in other words, it's it's almost that it, it smacks, and I hope I'm not being too ungenerous here. It almost smacks of of creating an original sin. Right? Um, that Europe was always already racial, right? and it's it's not it's not entirely unlike you know the the kind of the American exceptionalism that underlies mythological Atlanticism. Americans are what I get yet again ex exceptional. Um, or they had to excel this time in the act of expropriation, exploitation. And again, Europeans, once again, they have something unique about them. They're really bastards, really. Just like they've always been racial, they've always been colonists, they've always been. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, 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 this is, this is not exonerate, obviously. Um, the, the record of colonialism is far from it, but um, it, it seems to me to sort of. Uh, uh, slide unwittingly perhaps into such a form of morality play um, that again, uh, that, that the historical record and the analytic armature of which I don't find particularly convincing. Sorry for the intervention, Melanie. Sorry, the interruption. No worries. Um, Gominda Bambara. Hi. Um, congratulations on the move to SOAS. It's great that you'll be up the road and I hope we get more opportunities to have these conversations. I'd just like to follow up on this sort of conversation of racial capitalism in part because, I mean, in its own terms, racial capitalism is a tautology for the proponents of racial capitalism. And I joke sometimes that it's like when people say naan bread, when naan actually means bread. So all you're saying is bread, bread. But in that context, if we were to move this away from uh, the idea of racial capitalism, the thing that I'm interested in is what consequence does colonialism have to your understanding of capitalism? Because it appears 
that in the work that you do, which I've enjoyed reading very much, there's a sense in which an engagement with colonial histories gives some empirical evidence for revising understandings of capitalism, but not necessarily transforming those understandings. Because in terms of everything that you outline, why is it capitalism and not colonialism? So is the question about the primacy of an analytic as the sort of the lexical priority of an analytic over the other? I guess in part, because in a sense, the processes that you're talking about are processes that are in train prior to the development of the forms of capitalism that are otherwise seen to come into being. They're mm -hmm. both prior to it and continuous with it, but somehow mm -hmm. exist separately from the development that other people suggest that capitalism is. And so in that sense, is colonialism just the backdrop against which these events take place? And sometimes you can cherry pick bits and so on. Like what's the relationship between colonial histories understood um, both empirically and analytically for an analytical framework that has effectively been established without having taken colonial histories into account in the first place. So how useful is it to continue with a capitalist framework or a capitalist analytic that doesn't account for colonial histories and simply try and apply it to histories which are colonial? Ah, I think I, I see more clearly the distinction I'm trying to draw there. Um, I mean, the short answer to that is that I, I don't think uh, there is a, there is, I, I don't think it's tenable to have a, to take colonialism as a backdrop um, to the principal story of capitalism, um, in part because at least my understanding of capitalism, the kind of the theoretical wells from which I've, I've drawn, um, see capitalism historically as a colonial formation. And there's, the, there's a constitution, this imperial constitution of capitalism. Now, of course, um, one ought to differentiate the historical from the analytic register here. And so the, the primitive accumulation of capital um, was the, the was a retroactively constructed concept by Marx to figure out how the hell this all got up to, to working. But once that, uh, once once the, 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 the imperatives of accumulation and capital accumulation are set in motion, all the subsequent um, episodes and vectors of colonial expansion and all the transformations that come with it are always already implicated with these imperatives of expansion. Right? So th this doesn't mean that capitalism takes the front stage as a, um, a, a distinct and, and, and a uh, um, pristine analytic that then an all colonial expansion after that is simply an epiphenomenon of it and far from it. Right? Um, I do see those as inhabiting the same sort of historical terrain or the, the, the historical and empirical terrain um, that uh, the capitalism in, in so far as it has depended on the devaluation uh, of certain life worlds, life, labor, um, ecologies, and so on and so forth, and devalorization for continued reproduction and expansion. And this is really not my theoretical innovation, let's be very clear. It's, uh, it's Marxist feminists later on uh, built by uh, Marxist ecologists who have uh, come up with this, um, that there is no uh, thinking of capitalism without what we will consider to be logics of colonialism and imperialism that constantly produces and reproduces devalorized um, uh, ecologies, lives, uh, labor, and so on and so forth. So that is, if you will, at the level, at the, the level of the, even the logic or the theory of capitalism, you cannot exclude um, uh, a colonialism and reduce it to an expanded reproduction in the abstract schema. So in that sense, again, the, the Luxembourgian insight is, is quite central. We have any more questions or comments?
should have given that Thomas Smith. That's usually a a, a winner. It's a Southeast Asia. I, I presented this paper amongst imperial historians uh, at that, that, that Chicago. Even they had not heard of Crawford. So, Luisa, Luisa Odysseus. Thank you very much. One of the things that I am really interested in the way that you are seeking to locate racial capitalism is that uh, there is a parallel move which interests me greatly in, in some of my own work um, to do the same for slavery um, and, and, and sort of displace or pluralize uh, yeah, or, or dislodge the hegemony of the Atlantic model, so to speak. And I'm thinking here of the word of Angelia Rondekar. I don't know if you are familiar uh, with her work, who, who tries to, well, she, I'm not, I, and not having heard the entirety of your talk, I'm not sure she's doing exactly she's doing it exactly the way you are. But it, it's of great interest to me to pluralize uh, the ways in which we think about slavery and and, and its uh, you know kind of distinct historical manifestations elsewhere, such that we can then you know both have a better understanding of of slavery per se and its particular historical moments and as, as nodes. But, but also to, to simply not assume that we have a singular and exclusive model. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment that I, that I, you know, I, I, I appreciate uh, what you're trying to do if it is located you know, along these lines. And again, I'm sorry to have missed um, um, the early parts of your, of your talk. It's, uh, it's, there's a pandemic going on. Right, so let's let's keep that in mind. No, I, no, that that's that's a very fair point. Um, I'm not familiar with the work that you cited, but um, I think it was Edward Alpern, if I'm not mistaken, um, who uh, called out in early 2000s the what he called the tyranny of the Atlantic in slavery studies, and his emphasis was on the slave trade in East African Indian Ocean, and that that had been like swept away. Um, and then and, and completely overlooked in the fixation on the Atlantic as the site of slavery. And, but that aside, again, the geographic expense itself does not tell much. The, the question is what kind of social relations those geographic expenses or expansion of the geographic um, aperture um, that, that bring into, into to view. And the, the, uh, the, 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 the Indian Ocean and East Asian optic um, focalizes the uh, range of forms of bondage or bonded labor right, that escapes the um, the Atlantic uh, the, 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 um, prism of, of, of slavery versus free labor. And of course, if you ask any sort of scholar of slavery of the Atlantic or th um, their assault, they will say, well, obviously, Bondage is not just a binary, it's in the 19th century resolution of the problem of chattel slavery that gave us this ideological binary between chattel slavery and free labor. There were sharecropping, there were tenancy, there were all sorts of forms of bondage and so on. And that is very fair. Um, likewise, but the Indian Ocean um, provides, and the, the South Asia and Southeast Asia provide a whole panoply of forms of labor control that make it kind of spurious to talk about free versus unfree labor, but by and large is shades of unfreedom really. I mean, again, the question becomes what kinds of labor control or how labor control is, is organized in the service of capital. And in this regard, one of the, my sort of lodestars, theoretical lodestars is Jairus Banaji and his work on the, what he calls the fictions of free labor. And then under capitalism is just a, um, uh, uh, a, a terrain, variegated terrain of labor control that renders free on free distinction um, somewhat spurious. So I'm in very much uh, uh, in, in, in agreement with the kind of the 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 the, the sense of, you know, you know the, the spirit in which you asked the question. I and I completely agree. It's like these binaries are, are maybe it might be helpful starting points, but no more than starting points. I, I'm not sure if that's the, the gets us far when we ask these questions, was it free labor, on free labor, but rather how questions is, is the way forward it seems to me to be. But thank you. I hope this answers your question or I mean, at least addresses your comment in a, uh, in a satisfactory manner. Um, Jesus Luzado. <laughs> 
Hi, um, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, so maybe related to the to the Banaji uh, citation. So um, as you as people have mentioned, one of the things that's going on in Black Marxism is that Robinson, in giving a theory of racial capitalism, is also taught like his theory relies on the idea that racial capitalism is really just an outgrowth of a kind of feudal logic. Um, so I was wondering whether you see your own theorization of racial capitalism or, or of capitalist racialization as also having a bearing on sort of debates about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Ooh, that's that's a tough question. Um, I think the, okay, I, I don't think there's a short way of answering that question, but let me try. Um, if this is in line with my answer to, to Grimanda's uh, question. And um, I think this whole transition to capitalism in, in Europe and the English countryside um, has to be placed in a global and colonial context. Right? And there are various um, stabs at this, needless to say, even um, new institutional economics like Darren Ojemolu and, and, and James Robinson have taken a stab at this and the placing, so the, the 1866, the glorious revolution in, in, in Atlantic context. Um, more recently, Alejandro Coraz and Nandine Kampling in Capitalism and the Sea have made a similar point, etc. So uh, there is no question that there is a, there was something peculiar about Northwest Europe. Um, the fact that the emphasize the coloniality of I don't like that word, but colonial origins and constitution of, of capitalism does not mean to, um, that does not necessitate arguing that it didn't, it, Europe had nothing to do with it. Let me put it that way, right? So I think the, the imagery or you know, the metaphor uh, would be one of archipelagos of, of, of transformation networked by flows of commodities, capital, commerce, finance, labor, um, free and unfree, right? mostly well, on free, mostly. And construing Northwest Europe as a privileged node in those networks, right? but without which Northwest Europe would not be what it is. It would remain, and this is the Pirantis, is probably just a cold and backward backwash in the Eurasian landmass, really. Right? So it's that network and the particular lo lo location in that network. And obviously, the contingency, I mean, if this was this was not destined to transition from feudalism to capitalism, that, that plays the role. And, and I think the, the, the challenge is not so much to find this, like the, the, the answer 42, but to clarify the question, right? Um, how, what are the concepts, what are the theoretical frameworks that would be adequate to um, capturing the specificity of Northwest Europe's location in these networks, its agency and you know, the, the sheer contingency without, again, um, the, 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 the um, descending into um, like a, the, the Whiggish uh, the, the history writing. Right? So I don't know how much this answers your question, but um, it's again, this is kind of the, 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 the infrastructure, the hardware of my thinking about the colonial origins and the imperial constitution of uh, the global origins and the, the colonial um, constitution of capitalism in which I would try to make sense of where race fits, where gender fits and, and other lines of differentiation um, fit and institutional innovations fit and so on. I hope this answers your question. Again, this is, this is the short version. I mean, you know, God help you if uh, I would try to figure out the long one. Thanks. Do we have any other questions or comments? Louisa, did you want to, after all, ask your question or? Any other questions, comments? Give it another moment. <laughs> 
Great, so I'll wrap it up. Um, um, Ulash, thank you so much for a very engaging lecture. And I think we're all really um, excited and look forward um, to your new book projects in the plural, I suppose. Um, I want to very quickly plug our next event at the Center for Advanced International Theory. And that's on the 24th of November, we are hosting Professor Sumi Madok from the London School of Economics who will present research from her new book titled Vernacular Rights Cultures, The Politics of Origins, Human Rights and Gendered Struggle for Justice. And to keep up with our programming, you know, feel free to um, follow us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook. And of course, um, you can follow us on our website. Again, thanks so much, Ulash, and thank you to the audience um, for your engagement. Pleasure all mine. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you all for your engagement. Next time, I promise I'll come up with something more canonical. I'll do Smith or, or Locke or, 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 or something um, that, that, that's easier to sink one's teeth into. But, um, but thank you all for your time and engagement. I appreciate it. And thank you, Melanie, for making this possible. And to Eve, obviously, uh, for, for, again, making it possible. So thank you. Yeah, have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.